Hello and welcome everybody to today's talk entitled Enabling and Accelerating Nested Multi-Level Algorithms via Predictive Sensitivity. I'm Florian Doeffler and this is joint work first and foremost with my student Miguel Picala Cruz and senior collaborator Severio Bolognani. Let me jump right into an example to motivate the story of this talk. We consider a constraint optimization problem, minimize the cost f of, f, f of x, subject to constraint ax minus b is less or equal to zero. We form the Lagrangian of the problem with multiplier lambda, which is non-negative, so this Lagrangian is convex concave, and now we design continuous time flows that seek the subtle points of that algorithm. Well, the most classic flow is due to Aaron Horowitz called the saddle point flow. So to seek the saddle points, we um, increase in the direction of lambda to Lagrangian, so we go up the gradient, and we get on the gradient in the primal variable x. Additionally, we need to project here on the positive order to make sure that the multipliers remain non-negative. And this vector field would seek the subtle points of the Lagrangian. Additionally, you can uh, equip it with time constant t lambda tx um, to speed up the primal relative to the dual or vice versa. Now, what is interesting would be what if you make the primal iteration or flow much faster than dual flow? Then you end up with something called the dual ascent where the dual update is not changed, you increase the Lagrangian with a projection. But for the primal variable, you compute right away the minimum of the Lagrangian. So x star is the argument of L of x lambda. And this argument enters then here in the dual update. You can think about this as sort of the singularly perturbed limit of the subtle flow. Namely, um, to compute that argument, you run a gradient flow uh, on a very fast time scale, so you run this much faster rate. So you call this tx verb now here an epsilon, and epsilon is small. And in particular, if you let epsilon go to zero, you recover computing the argument. Now, if you were to implement this algorithm in discrete time, what would this mean? You would have to run a whole bunch of iteration, a gradient descent iteration, to compute the argument of the Lagrangian. Then you do one update step of the dual variable, and again, you run a lot of iteration for the primal variable. So you run into nested iterations. Here's a um, simulation of what this looks like, a discrete time simulation. What you can see here is in red, the dual ascent, which converges very quickly and performs very nicely. In comparison, the primal dual flow would uh, have quite oscillatory transients and converge much more slowly. What you don't see here, of course, is that you need to run a whole bunch of nested iterations to compute that um, Argmin when you run the dual ascent. In short, neither of the two methods are really satisfactory. And this is what we want to address today. Let's abstract the situation a little bit and go to multi time scale systems. So, general interconnected systems, x1 dot is f1, x2 dot is equal to f2, are hard to analyze. Or if you want to design the system through controls, they're also hard to design and come up with reasonable certificates unless you put some more structure on these vector fields. The design and analysis, of course, is much more easy, provided that there's a time scale separation in these two systems, which is a trick that we play in engineering algorithm design all the time. In particular, let's assume the second system is much faster, in fact, infinitely faster, so it runs on a different time scale. There's a time scale tau of the second system. The dynamics of the first, first system are frozen. So the X1 does not change on the fast time scale of the second system. This system would quickly converge to its equilibrium, which is given by F2 is equal to zero. And then the slow dynamical system would just evolve as X1 is equal to F1 of X1, X2, assuming that the second vector field is in equilibrium. Clearly in this idealized setting, things are easier, um, but as you've seen, when you implement this in algorithms, you run to nested iterations. The approximation of this two time scale system on a single time scale is through single perturbation methods. We say that second system has a time constant epsilon, which is very small, in fact, as small as you can make it. And you can formally show that this approximates this two time scale system under some assumptions. So you can map the trajectories to another, up to an order epsilon distance, you can map stability properties to another, and so on. More generally, you can think about an interconnect system which has a generalized time constant or conditioning matrix M on the left-hand side. For instance, for the single perturbed system, M would be the matrix that has identity, so the time constant for X1, 
and epsilon, the time constant for x2. And often we can think about the m being a design parameter as an optimization algorithm, or also nested control loops as in cascade control, m would be the result of choosing control queens. So for instance, if you do cascade control, then the inner fast loop would give you rise to a short time constant, whereas the outer loop would be the slow one. And what is, what is this all about? What we want to do today? We want to achieve the beneficial properties of the idealized two time scale interconnection, which is very easy to analyze. Okay? And we'd like to achieve these properties without doing the time scale separation. Okay? Because we don't like, for instance, for the optimization algorithms, nested durations, or if you think about cascade control, we don't like the conservativeness of the two time scale design for cascade control. So, what I want to do today is choose a clever non singular conditioning matrix M, so a time constant matrix if you want so, that preserves the stability of the two time scale system. So, ideally, we end up with that simple analysis, but without doing any time scale separation. Okay, so we don't want to implement nested iterations for optimization. And the way we go about this is the sensitivity decoupling approach. Let me walk you through this. So the setup is this two interconnect systems with states x1, x2. If the second system was at equilibrium, so we have zero is equal to f2, we assume that there's an explicit map x2s as a function of x1 that characterizes the steady state, okay? So in steady state, x2s is a function of x1. We can, just to illustrate what that means, analyze our ideal two time scale system with that notation X2S. So the fast boundary layer system where we assume that X1 is frozen in time, so this is just a constant. If this has suitable stability properties, then we have that X2 of T will converge to X2S of X1. And of course, X1 is considered frozen. In general, X1 is time varying, so it would track that time varying X1 of T curve. On the other hand, for the slow reduced dynamics, where we assume the second vector field is at equilibrium, what does that mean? We plug in for x2, the steady state map, x2s, and the dynamics are x1 dot f1 of x1 and x2s of x1. And I don't want to carry this term with me, so let me just call it f1r, where the superscript r stands for reduced. So this two time system idealized is, of course, decoupled. You can see it's a cascade system. The fast system, the so-called boundary layer, relaxes very quickly to the steady state X2S, and then the slow system will fall. But as you've also seen, if you want to implement this, for instance, algorithms you need to run this iteration, which comes with its own problems. So what do we do about it? We want to decouple these two dynamics, but now in the same time scale. Okay. So how can we decouple the X2 dynamics from X1? What we do, we take that steady state and we add a drift term to our x2 vector field. And the drift term depends on how x2s is changing as a function of how x1 of t is changing with time. What does this mean? We add here a sensitivity term that would anticipate how the steady state of x2 changes since x1 of t is changing over time. OK, what's the, the rationale behind that? You can see this algebraically. Let me bring this term here to the other side of the ODE. And it reads as d of dt x2 minus x2s, which is equal to that vector field, which is exactly the boundary layer dynamics. I could now subtract from that vector field just zero. In particular, what I subtract is the second vector field evaluated at steady state. So I replaced x2 by x2s, which gives me this. And now, just for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of argument, let me assume the vector field f2 is linear. Then this term cancels. And what I'm left with is just the second vector field, the value of x1 is zero and x2 minus x2s. And under the suitable stability properties of the boundary layer system, also the second vector field would relax and converge to x2s. Okay, so we recover actually the nice convergence of the boundary layer dynamics by adding the sensitivity term. Moreover, once x2s converge to x2s, we can plug this into the first vector field and then recover the slow reduced dynamics. Takeaway is if we add this sensitivity term, okay, how does the steady state change as a function of how x1 of t changes, then we recover the nice stability properties of a two time scale system of this idealized interconnection, but without having to make any time scale separation, meaning we don't have to run nested iterations and optimization. 
how do you implement this guy? So here you see the same as in the previous slide, just to keep the notation with me. So that's the setup, the interconnect system, and we have the steady state map x to s of x1. And this is the sensitivity coupling, that is, we add this drift term to the x2 dynamics, which of course you can easily do when you design, for instance, algorithms, but also in cascade control, you could do this. How do you implement this term? Well, you should be inclined to take the chain rule. That is the way to the time derivative. You first take the derivative of respect to x1, so the partial of respect to x1, times the time derivative of x1, x1 dot, which is the vector field f1. Okay, so the complexity of implementation now reduces to you have to estimate that sensitivity somehow. You have to get this. So what's the sensitivity of the steady state map x2 s of x1 with respect to x1? Well, you don't have this in closed form at your disposal, but what you can do, you can appeal to the implicit function theorem. Namely, the implicit function theorem would tell you that that sensitivity is locally given by minus the partial with respect to x2 inverse times the partial with respect to x1. And all of this, of course, evaluated at the point um, where you want to evaluate this, namely at x2 s of x1 at steady state. Now, this only holds locally. What we do now, we take a bold move, and then we assume, let's just take this thing globally, assuming that this guy is invertible globally, so we can actually solve for x2 s of x1, and it's derivative. And let's just call this the extended sensitivity, understanding that locally, this is exactly a sensitivity that will come from the implicit function theorem. So that's what we implement. So to implement this term, we take the sensitivity S x1, x2, which is this matrix here, okay, times f1. And you can also rewrite this as a generalized conditioning matrix. So I can bring this guy essentially to the other side and I call f1, x1 dot. And what I get is this um, lower triangular sensitivity conditioning matrix where you have minus the sensitivity. If you want to think about how this looks like in a block diagram, here you have the x1 dynamics, here you have the x2 dynamics. And what you add essentially is a feed forward derivative type term in that term to implement these things. Okay, before I tell you how that works and if it works, I want to go back to the motivating example. So the constraint optimization problem, we form the convex concave Lagrangian. We have seen the saddle flow go up the Lagrangian in the London direction, go down the Lagrangian in the X direction with some kind of constants. This now you can call the single time scale interconnection. We've seen the dual ascent, where the second iteration now is infinitely fast. Essentially, that's a two time scale of the system. And now you can also think about the sensitivity conditioning, which would do the following. It would essentially run a gradient descent on the primal variable, which is this here with some time constant t. And then you add the sensitivity term. So here you have the sensitivity times lambda dot, which is in the previous notation just the f1, the first vector field. Okay. What is the sensitivity matrix? It turns out here you can compute it as actually a transpose, which is the constraint matrix, times the inverse hessian of the vector field. Okay, so it's a little bit reminiscent of a, of a Newton flow. In particular, assuming here would not be the hessian matrix inverse, but just a constant, then what, what you see here would be exactly what you get when you do the primal dual saddle flow on the top of an augmented Lagrangian, where you add essentially ax minus b squared times a constant to the cost function. So it's somewhat similar to an old friend. Let's implement all of this on the same example. So you've already seen the, the red curve, which is the dual ascent, the primal dual, which is the oscillatory curve. And you see the sensitivity conditioning, which is the green curve, which would converge very nicely and very quickly. Most importantly, for this one, you don't have to run any nested iterations. OK, so the, this plot shows everything. There's no hidden iterations here. Just for the sake of comparison, I'll also show you what happens if you replace this term by a constant when you get the subtle flow with respect to an augmented Lagrangian. It looks conceptually similar. It has a slight bump here, but otherwise very much the same. Okay, so you can recover some old friends and improve over the existing dynamics. <clears throat> Let's analyze this thing. So we think about this interconnected system now where we have this generalized conditioning matrix M with the sensitivity. Let's first analyze its Jacobian. So that's M inverse times this thing. And we don't see much. Um, you only see things after you go through a similarity transformation with the matrix M. 
And in this case, the Jacobian nicely decouples, becomes block triangular, so there's a zero here. And what you get here is the Jacobian of the reduced vector field, the same as what is slow reduced in the two time scale system. And here you get the Jacobian of the fast boundary layer dynamics, meaning you perfectly want to want to recover the local stability properties of the two time scale system. You can also do this globally. So if you know the tricks of the trade, you know how you can extend Jacobian techniques globally using contraction or Krasovsky methods in particular. If you make the same assumption as you do for single perturbation, maybe that this boundary layer vector field is exponentially stable, in this case globally, then you can also get very good results with the extended sensitivity. Maybe assuming F2 is globally contracting, uniform in X1, then X2S of X1 turns out to be exponentially stable due to that, sens due to that sensitivity term. And this holds independently of X1 dot. Okay? For those of you that are not familiar with contract Krasovsky methods, let me show you this algebraically. So you construct the krasovsky Lyapunov function, essentially f2 squared, with some metric p. You take the time derivative. That will depend, of course, on x1 dot. But the x1 dot term will cancel because of that other sensitivity term, meaning at the end, you only get the contraction condition on the f2 vector field. Okay, So this holds all independently of x1 dot. Moreover, if the reduced vector field is also globally contracting, then the desired steady state x1s, x2s of x1s is globally exponentially stable. Now, none of this has to be done globally. You can also do it locally within contraction regions. Okay, But what the takeaway is more or less what that sensitivity conditioning does, it turns a closed loop system. We would have here full-blown Jacobian, full-blown coupled Lyapunov equation into a cascade where the x1 term does not affect the fast dynamics, and you can also see this in the upper conditions, which is very nice. Okay, so from a stability perspective, you turn a closed loop into a cascade. And you can do all of this, of course, in multiple time scales. You can also reverse engineer existing optimization methods, for instance, uh, interior point method. So you have here minimize an objective subject to the equality constraint ax minus b less than zero. What you do, you form a log barrier function phi, where you have the objective, and you have the log of the constraint violation for all the constraint, you have a multiply mu. And the standard approach with the continuous time version thereof would be you do a gradient descent very fast with an epsilon on the log barrier function, while you slowly um, decrease the mu here in front of the log barrier. Well, this is not a single perturbed version. What you can do is not a sensitivity conditioning which we add to that gradient descent, um, this extra sensitivity term times mu dot, and you don't need the epsilon anymore. So no more nested iteration. Actually, it turns out now you recover a prediction correction method for um, time varying convex optimization using tier points, okay? Likewise, when you go to time varying optimization with f of x and t, so you have time dependence of the objective, it turns out Without going through the details, if you do the sensitivity conditioning, again, you recover an existing predictor corrector method that people have already proposed. You can apply everything to Stackelberg, leader follow up, population games, again, with sensitivity terms. You can also um, reverse engineer backstepping, that is, in the sum assumption, backstepping turns out to be a special case of this predictive sensitivity, the sensitivity conditioning. Okay. Um, but what we were interested in not reverse engineering things, actually the reason why we came up with this sensitivity conditioning was because we're interested in bi-level optimization. That is an optimization problem, minimize of x1 on x2 star across function f, where x2 star itself is the minimum of another optimization problem. So the constraint is again another optimization problem, which is relevant in Stackelberg games, where I say here you have the leader that wants to minimize an objective, anticipating that also the follower will minimize its objective. You can have zero sum games where F2 is minus F1, or any sort of sequential and nested decision making, such as you know, um, certain decoalance uh, control, we say here, find the best model, and here do the best control subject to the model that you found, just to give a few examples. So the solution of the inner problem, okay. Let's assume it exists and assume we can calculate sensitivity. So for this, we need to assume that the uh, Hessian of the inner problem is actually invertible. So we need essentially assume a strong convexity of the inner problem. 
and then we can compute the inner solution x2 star of x1. If we had that inner solution, then we can construct the reduced objective for the outer problem. We replace the x2 by x2 star of x1. Um, we can calculate the gradient of that reduced outer problem where very nicely the sensitivity that I introduced before would pop out. Okay. And now we can do a gradient descent, assuming we had this guy here at our disposal. So x1 naught is minus the partial free respect to x1 of the reduced cost, assuming that x2 star is the argument of F2. And of course, if you want to implement this in any sort of the algorithm, you need again nested iteration because you need to compute that argument whenever you call the gradient descent here. Alternatively, get around the nested iteration. You could think about a single perturbed epsilon gradient flow where you run a gradient flow on the reduced outer problem and also on the inner problem, but inner problem is a very fast flow, so epsilon is big small. Or you can try our predictive sensitivity. We just run the gradient flows in parallel of the inner and the outer problem, where you add here the predictive sensitivity term. How does this all this compare for any particular problem? So here the outer problem would be in this case a quadratic one, and the inner one would have an exponential term. Um, not obvious at first sight, but the origin is the minimizer. So what would happen? Let me first look at the green curve. Say you start from here. You follow the green curve, which is the predictive sensitivity, and would very nicely get you to the optimize at the origin. In time domain, the states x i of t would um, relax very quickly to desired origin. Of course, it's all in discrete time implemented. Whereas if you were to run an epsilon gradient descent, so running the inner iterations much faster than the outer one, this would also get you there eventually. If you pick epsilon sufficiently small, say one half, but it would be quite oscillatory and conversion is much slower. Whereas if you choose epsilon now to be two over three, things will not converge at all. Everything can also be done for constraint bi-level optimization. I will not go into the details, but essentially we accelerate the subtle flows for the in and out the problem using predictive sensitivity. And again, this would very nicely converge the green curve, whereas any sort of you know, epsilon version thereof, where you run the inner iterations fast in the outer, would maybe converge with a very poor performance. Uh, or not converge at all, depending how you choose the epsilon. Very well, that brings me to the end. The conclusion is I showed you this sensitivity conditioning, where we want to recover the stability properties of the time scale separated system without doing time scale separation. So we don't have to run any nested iterations. I showed you some apl applications to uh, nested optimization without the nested iterations. Um, there's a paper that covers much more than what I told you about. Um, we relate this to backstepping, we relate this to multi time scale systems, not just two time scales. And we work on applications of this for cascade control and feedback optimization. With regards to future work, where do you want to take this? Well, we want to accelerate nested decision making, in particular problems like adaptive control. And in the optimization context, of course, it's very interesting to work with non differential vector fields as the rise wins from projections. This brings me to the end. Thank you very much for listening.